All right, everyone, we're going to go ahead and get started with the presentations here tonight. Thank you all so, so much for coming. Uh, please have a seat, and we will go ahead and get started. We'll open up the open house again after the presentation, so there should be plenty of time for Q&A with all of our different exhibitors. So first, I just want to say welcome to this carbon management workshop hosted by Climate Now and sponsored by the Department of Energy, the U.S. Department of Energy. And uh, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency is also a partner uh, in developing this workshop. So my name is Emma Crow Willard, and I am from Climate Now. I'll be your MC for the evening. Uh, if you need translation to another language, um, we have this translation service. You just need to plug in your phone or scan the QR code and listen to it on your headphones. Um, we have these wonderful Spanish interpreters here, and so I'm going to pass it over to Yesenia to help explain how to use it. Para las personas que van a estar necesitando interpretación, mi nombre es Yesenia Biascochea y tengo una de mis colegas con nosotros también interpretando. Si usted necesita interpretación en español, le vamos a pedir por favor que en sus mesas hay un, un papelito donde va a tener este QR code. Usted también lo puede agarrar y tomarle una foto con su teléfono para poder conectarse a, y entender en el idioma de su corazón. Um, si necesita interpretación de nuevo, por favor, um, estamos en la mesa de al lado junto con mi compañera para que pueda accesar en el idioma de su corazón. Thank you. All right. Thank you all so much for coming. Uh, so a few different things. Um, one is that we are going to be having uh, these presentations and then uh, not a lot of time and not time for Q&A in between presentations because we want to maximize Q&A with, with all of the booths so that more people will have the opportunity to ask more questions. And so that being said, um, there are index cards on your, on your tables. And so you can write down your questions as we go through the different presentations on the index cards. Um, and so keep that in mind so that you don't forget your questions. Uh, this workshop is intended to be an opportunity for learning and we want to learn a lot of different things. We received a lot of questions from a lot of registrants, and we hope to address many of them tonight. Uh, we will learn what the term carbon management means, uh, what type of carbon management projects could take place in southern Colorado within the context of Colorado's climate and energy plans, uh, how community members living in the region can engage and participate in the project development process, and then how projects can be deployed with safety as a top priority. So we have federal, state, and local representatives here tonight, uh, and the DOE project selectees as well to help answer questions, and they will present here on these topics shortly. As a reminder, this is an open forum meant to encourage discussion and collaboration. And the presentations today are not solely reflective of the views of Climate Now, uh, DOE, or the other organizations here. So I want to say just a little bit about how that we structured the program. Uh, in order to maximize opportunities for questions, we're having several short presentations. And then we will transition to the open house after this. Um, please consider making it a goal to learn something new and perhaps to understand another's point of view uh, because we won't have a question and answer session between the presentations. I encourage you, as I mentioned, to write your questions on those index cards on your tables so that you don't forget them. And with that, I would like to kick it off uh, with our first presentation by introducing our first speaker, Josh Shidley, from DOE's National Renewable Energy Laboratory to explain what carbon management is. Josh. All right, 
Thank you very much. Uh, I'm very excited to be here. Thank you, Emma, for the introduction, and I'm looking forward to the dialogue today. What I want to try to do is kind of take its opportunity to level set us and make sure that we're all talking about kind of carbon management in the same way and define some of the key terminology in this space. And before I do that, where I want to jump in is, you know, this term of, of climate change is all often talked about in a very global sense, right? We think about this kind of around the world. And it's often helpful to think about this in the context of locally, how this is impacting us. And so this is a plot that shows specifically for the state of Colorado, how temperature change has occurred over the last 100 years. And what you'll notice is on this plot, there are two different lines showing the trend over time. And if you look at the orange line on here, this is a 100-year trend. You can see how that's ramping up over that period. And then you can look at the darker red line, which is just looking at the last 30 years. And you can see how this is trending further and further upward and has a steeper curve just more recently. And so this is something I worry a lot about. I have three kids. I'm raising my family here in Colorado. You know, I worry about how this is going to impact us, both in the near term and in the long term. And this is historical data, but you can take that data and make projections out into the future. And you can look at how projections suggest that you know, in the coming decades, average temperature in Colorado might be four or five degrees Fahrenheit above where it typically is. That impacts agriculture, that impacts water availability, impacts energy resources, has multiple impacts across the state. And so one of the questions that often comes up is, well, then what can we do about it? And if you read the news, you talk to your neighbors, what you hear is a lot of different terms thrown around. Terms like negative emissions technologies, carbon management, electrification, decarbonization, defossilization, CCUS, carbon storage, power to X, carbon sequestration, CO2 removal. Right? It's hard to keep all of these things straight. It's hard to understand what all of these terms mean. Some of these on here even mean the same thing. They're just used in different parts of the country, different parts of the world. And so what I wanted to do is start with just a basis of a few definitions. And so first and foremost, when we talk about decarbonization, this is a very broad term. And it refers to our efforts to reduce carbon dioxide emissions from human activity. And so why we say this is a broad term is it refers to many different approaches. This can be more efficient buildings. This can be using batteries in our, in our vehicles. This can be producing electricity through solar and wind and hydro. And it also can be capturing CO2 from point source emissions and sequestering it. And so as we get more specific in these definitions, we come to the term of carbon management. This refers to a suite of technologies that capture, remove, transport, and permanently store that carbon dioxide or convert it into durable products. And when we talk about carbon management, we're talking about carbon dioxide management. And within that context, there's two ways that we often refer to this, one being thinking about capturing the CO2 from a point source. Think about an industrial facility like a cement plant or a steel making facility, and you're capturing that CO2 from that plant and that facility before it ever gets out into the atmosphere. Another area of focus is carbon dioxide removal, often referred to as CDR. In these cases, these are activities where we're trying to actively remove CO2 from the atmosphere. So it's already been emitted. We're dealing with CO2 that is already in the atmosphere, and we're trying to pull it back out of the atmosphere. In both cases, we need to sequester that CO2 or convert it into durable products. Now, I also think it's helpful to consider scale of this challenge that we face. And it's not always easy to think about this scale, and so I've tried to find a way to make that more tangible. And so if we think about the trash that we take out to the street every week, for pickup, that is roughly, if you think about globally, roughly 2 billion tons per year of solid waste trash that we have across the globe. If we think about the amount of carbon dioxide that we're dealing with every year that is emitted out, we're talking about an order of magnitude larger. So hopefully that helps you wrap your mind around how big and how much 
of this of this component, carbon dioxide, we have and are just putting out every year the same way we do take trash out to the street. So if we go back to what we can do about it in addressing this challenge, there's a curve here that shows how we can change our trajectory of climate change over time, projecting out into the future. And the first priority, which gives us a, the most significant impact, is through this mechanism of what I just talked about before, which is these means to decarbonize and conventionally abate, so ways to mitigate our emissions. How do we reduce the amount of carbon dioxide emissions? But importantly, there's going to be a number of activities that we continue to do as humans that are going to be still emitting CO2. And so if we want to continue down to a point where we have net zero emissions, there's a number of technologies down here called net negative technologies. This is the carbon dioxide removal technologies that I referred to on the previous page. And so these are our options. And one way that I like to speak about this is to think about carbon dioxide as a bathtub. So we'll walk through this analogy. This is our bathtub. The water in the bathtub is CO2. If you look back in the year 1960, we had about 315 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere. And what we've been doing for quite some time is putting more CO2 into that bathtub. All of our activities, driving around, flying around, all of our activities, producing power, putting more and more CO2 into that bathtub, such that we're at the point now where we've increased this to 420, approximately 420 parts per million in this current year. And the concern is, is that, of course, if there's no change here and we keep putting CO2 in the atmosphere, you're going to end up with a catastrophic failure, going to overflow, and this is the point we want to avoid. And so if we go back to where we are today and we think about, well, what can we do to address the current situation? Our first priority is to reduce the flow of CO2 into that bathtub. That's reducing the emissions. That's our long-term goal. But how do we go about getting there? And so if we go back and think about where we are today and where our emissions are coming from, this is a chart that breaks down across the United States where the carbon dioxide is coming from. And what you'll note here is you know, roughly equal parts across our transportation sector, electricity generation, and industrial. So for a lot of the light duty transportation, our passenger vehicles, that's easier to decarbonize through battery electric vehicles. Electricity generation, we're seeing progress in solar and wind and other options to generate electricity through renewable resources. But when you get to this industrial sector, this is very hard to avoid emissions from those facilities. And so that's one area we specifically are targeting carbon management and carbon capture and sequestration uh, activities. And so when we think about that, that is what we're trying to do with CO2 capture and storage is we're essentially trying to divert some of those emissions that we're sending out in the atmosphere today, recapture them, reroute them, and put them into permanent storage, typically, or in one case, in a geologic reservoir subsurface. In the same vein, we can think about carbon dioxide removal now as a means to, no matter what, if we keep adding to this bathtub, it's going to keep going up. The only way to start reducing that further is through CO2 removal. So again, this is now draining that bathtub and putting that CO2 into a, a separate reservoir. And so what I want to do is just highlight briefly two quick slides on each of those major areas, carbon capture, transport, and storage. As I just highlighted, this is a tool to help us decarbonize industry, help us reduce emissions from industry. And it's supported by decades of, of research, demonstration activities, um, many of which have been supported by the Department of Energy. These point sources of CO2 can range from cement plants, steel plants, petrochemical facilities, and others. And beyond just the CO2 capture and reduced emissions from a climate change perspective, there's also opportunities to improve local air quality. Because to do this type of CO2 capture, you also have to address sulfur oxide emissions, you have to address part of particulate matter emissions, thereby providing opportunities for better local air quality. And when we think about Colorado as well as our neighboring states, there's quite a bit of opportunity space for carbon dioxide storage subsurface. The final slide I'll highlight is on carbon dioxide removal. 
And as I mentioned, this is addressing the, our need to remove CO2 from the atmosphere. This industry is more nascent, more starting up, uh, but we expect to need this scaled deployment out in the future, which is why we need to act now to begin this process. And there's quite a few different pathways and approaches to, uh, to, a, to pursue carbon dioxide removal, one of which is often talked about in a specific project related to Pueblo, is direct air capture. And this area is one where we're focused on and require this high quality durable storage of that CO2. And we're understanding all those risks and trade-offs of this emerging industry. And so finally, I would just like to say, uh, very excited to be here. Uh, I've got three of my team members here with me as well. Uh, Lisa sitting back at our booth, and then Liz and Ann, who are all here. Very excited to engage in dialogue. Please come see us at the booth. And my contact information is up here if anybody would like to email me. So thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you so, so much, Josh. So um, I'd like, like to now introduce uh, Dominique Gomez from the Colorado Energy Office to give us a sense of Colorado's energy and climate goals and how carbon management fits in. Thank you, Emma. Um, as Emma mentioned, I'm Dominique Gomez. I'm with the Colorado Energy Office. And I just wanted to give a little bit of the broader context about climate change in Colorado and where carbon management fits. So as we just covered a little bit, you know, why are we doing this? Just reminding people that people are already feeling the impacts of climate change today in Colorado. You know, everything from extreme heat to extreme weather and that that affects people's lives and that's why we're taking action. When we look at emissions in Colorado, it's not too different from what um, was just presented. You know, the largest source of emissions in the state is from transportation. Um, electricity is a large source, but that's rapidly changing. Um, industrial emissions, oil and gas, and then we still see emissions from agriculture and other sources. So when we think about our strategies, you know, where the emissions are coming from is, is really important. Our state has fairly aggressive climate change goals, and these are set by the legislature. So our, uh, the energy office where I work uh, works with departments across the state to work towards these uh, emission reductions. And we actually just released a new roadmap, which is a set of actions that we're committed to taking over the next couple of years to make sure we're on track to reduce emissions and hit these targets. The next really big one being in 2030. There is one in 2025, but a lot of the, the strategies that we're taking are really aimed at that 2030 target. As I mentioned, we just released this roadmap. It came out in February. Um, it's good to see many familiar faces. We did a lot of outreach as part of that roadmap update, and so we heard from a lot of people across the state. In the end, we committed to 49 additional actions that the state is going to take in the next three years to reduce emissions, um, and it really runs the gamut. So everything from things that we're doing on the clean energy side to tackling transportation emissions, our largest source of emissions, and recognizing that that takes a host of different kinds of strategies, certainly moving to electric vehicles, but also thinking a lot about how we build our communities, where people live and work, and how they get to and from school and other places they need to go. We did a lot of community engagement, and I think that you know meetings like this are so important because it's important to understand the concerns and desires of community members when we're making these plans as local, state, and, and federal governments. And when we talked to people about climate change in Colorado, we actually heard a lot of similar things. You know, we went all the way across the state, and, and things that we heard included the, the need to prioritize current needs of Coloradans, especially affordability. You know, people need to be able to afford to live and work and travel. And as we make climate change policies, we need to remember those things. They want to be able to get where they need to go, to not always have to have a car. And they want to make sure that they have jobs and that people who, um, whose jobs are impacted by climate change and the climate change transition, clean energy transition, that we're making sure to support them as well. The state's committed to a bunch of new actions, and what we've um, modeled is that that puts us well on the way towards um, hitting our emission reduction targets. So you can see that down steep trajectory of that green line. Um, that's all the actions that are sort of on the books or that we've committed to as part of this um, emission reduction target. But you'll see that there's still a little bit you know, to go, especially as we look out towards those later goals in 2050. And that's really where things like carbon management come into play. And um, you know, the, the main thing that I'm here to say, I'll kind of get out of the way for the people on this side of the room, is that, you know, carbon management is a small piece, but an important piece of the puzzle. 
it is not the main strategy to how we're meeting our climate change goals. The way that we're really meeting our climate change goals is through a rapid transition to clean energy and through electrification. So that just means lots of wind, lots of solar, very quick transition to those things. And then a lot of electrification, certainly in the transportation sector, but also in all sorts of other sectors, including in the industrial sector and in buildings. There's a lot of work that goes into it, but we kind of understand more or less a lot of the technologies. We kind of understand the playback playbook. That is the strategy. Carbon management is a piece of the strategy for a small amount of emissions overall. But it's an important amount of emissions because it's things that we're not exactly sure how to reduce at this point in other ways. So, you know, there's a key couple areas where we think garbage management could play a really key role. So that includes, you know, carbon capture for hard to decarbonize industrial processes. Again, electrification can play a big part of it. We know that we can do renewables, but what about the rest of it? That's where carbon management could play a role. Um, carbon capture for backup gas generation. Again, in the electricity sector, we're moving really quickly to wind and solar, maybe some geothermal storage, these clean technologies, but there might be a, a small role for carbon capture as well. And then direct air capture, you know, that bathtub um, metaphor of how do we reduce uh, carbon that's already in the air. And so we, we know because Colorado is a place that we have abundant wind and solar resources, direct air capture might be something that's a, a good opportunity here in the state. And then lastly, there's a lot of natural options as well for soil sequestration. You know, when we did our meetings across the state, we know that there's a lot of interest in healthy soils, in um, forestry and other, other technologies that can make sure that we're also sequestering carbon in a natural way. So that's my main thing. Happy to talk to folks more as we have questions. I know this was a quick overview, but um, just want to make sure everyone knows, you know, the state of Colorado is really committed to reducing our emissions very quickly, very interested and supportive of, of carbon capture for that really small but important role that it might play. Great. Thank you, Dominique. Okay, so we're going to pull some chairs out of the closet here so some more folks can sit down. Uh, so you guys, unless you want to stand, by all means stand, but otherwise we're definitely going to bring some more chairs in for you to make sure that you, uh, I'm going backwards that you've got somewhere to sit and just um, in case you wanted to contact Dominique or Quinn also at the Colorado Energy Office, that's their email information right there. All right, so um, they're just gonna grab some chairs out. So I'll say a little something about our um, upcoming speakers. So next up we have Madeline Percy and Amber Egland from the uh, Colorado Department of Public Health and the Environment. And they're going to bring a little bit of, of air quality context and more, and then narrow it down into some Pueblo context because they're doing uh, a great project with Mothers Out Front, who we have here um, with a booth as well, to look at air quality in Pueblo, um, which is so, so important. And so um, I want to welcome Madeline and uh, Madeline and Amber up to the stage now that we've got our chairs out <laughs> Thank you so much. hi everybody my name is Dr. Madeline Percy, and along with Amber Eglin, we're with the Air Pollution Control Division, which is part of the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment, and we are absolutely thrilled to be here. I want to start by clarifying that we both have a bit of imposter syndrome because we really don't do that much with carbon management. At the end of the day, uh, we are part of this organization called the Education Community Opportunities Unit, and we work with, as I said, the Air Pollution Control Division, which along with the Air Quality Control Commission, which is a, a governor-appointed board, um, we think about greenhouse gas emissions, but we really are not thinking about those in terms of how can we, how, how can we manage carbon once it's in the atmosphere. Instead, we're really focused on those criteria pollutants and how that's going to affect human health. So the Air Quality Control Commission, which is again that gubernatorially appointed board, they're going to set greenhouse gas and criteria pollutant emissions limits as well as a focus on air toxics. All of these other pollutants, criteria pollutants and air toxics, can be the products of combustion. And so that's part of the reason that we're here today. 
They also report greenhouse gas emissions by sector. And then, as I said, we do not really regulate carbon capture in any way, shape, or form. Now, the Air Pollution Control Division, which is where Amber and I actually work, runs the day-to-day -day operations when it comes to both managing and permitting greenhouse gas emissions, as well as the amount of criteria pollutants and air toxics that various industrial sectors can, can create. Um, we enforce those state and federal laws, and then, of course, we conduct all of the public outreach when it comes to greenhouse gases. So I just want to kind of show you all the mission of the Air Pollution Control Division, and I'll give you a moment. And I want to highlight a couple of key statements here. Our role is to prevent harmful exposures to air pollution. We're reducing greenhouse gas emissions, but again, very much in a regulatory context. And then we're promoting environmental justice, which is one of the key reasons why Amber and I are here tonight. And so I'm going to turn it over to Amber to talk a little bit more about the work that we're doing with Mothers Out Front here in Pueblo. Thanks so much. Hi everybody, my name is Amber Egland. Um, like Madeline said, we are with the Education and Community Opportunities Unit within the Air Pollution Control Division. Um, short version is the Eco Unit. Um, and we are a brand new unit. We just started over the summer, um, but we have a lot of goals ahead of us. Um, so really excited to share those with you today. Um, but as you can see our mission up on the screen, and we. Our goals as a unit is really threefold, is to support the design and implementation of community-led air monitoring programs across Colorado, whether it's working with existing air monitoring networks or supporting the development of future air monitoring networks. Um, we really want to be the support for that. Um, additionally, we serve as liaisons between Colorado's communities um, and Air Pollution Control Division. So really helping to identify where support is needed and providing resources to those communities, communities where we identify that support. And then our third goal is to develop high quality, accurate educational and outreach materials um, to share to the broader public. But diving into that first goal, supporting community-led air monitoring programs, um, we are really excited to be working on our first program um, as a unit, uh, collaborating with our technical services program within the Air Pollution Control Division, uh, as well as collaborating with Mothers Out Front, which is a community-based organization, um, with their Clean Air Pueblo project. And the folks from Mothers Out Front are out in the back. Um, so I really encourage you all to stop by their table and learn about their really exciting um, initiatives that they're working on, um, but really excited to be working with them, and we're honored to spend a lot of time down in Pueblo. Um, so the Clean Air Pro Pueblo Project, their goal is really... Uh, they support environmental justice, non they're an environmental justice nonprofit mobilizing for a livable climate for all children. Um, and their goals really align with our goals as the Air Pollution Control Division. Um, and like Madeline mentioned in our mission statement, we are really supporting environmental justice initiatives in um, disproportionately impacted communities. And because Pueblo is identified as a disproportionately impacted communities based on a slew of socio and economic factors, um, this is why we chose to work down in Pueblo on this project. Uh, but really excited to be working um, with Mothers Out Front on this air monitoring project. Um, and we really um, specify saying community-led, meaning that we are supporting the technical aspects of this program, but the goals of this program really want it to be community-led, to have the community's goals in mind. Um, and this is a 388, about $389,000 EPA IRA grant that we are working on for the next three years. Um, we are just kicking off this pro project. Um, so excited to be standing up about eight AQ Sync air monitoring stations across community or across Pueblo, uh, measuring ozone and nitrogen oxides, um, as well as particulate matter, otherwise known as PM 2.5, and total volatile organic compounds. Um, and these are really either reference grade or near reference grade measurements, meaning that they are very accurate measurements. Um, and if you would actually. 
And then I also just wanted to quickly highlight before uh, moving on to talk to mothers out front in the back about some of their other air monitoring projects. Um, they have stood up some purple air monitors across the community, um, which I know they're very excited about those efforts as well. So please feel free to talk to them about that, as well as additional volunteer opportunities um, and the potential to host an air monitor. Um, so please feel free to reach out to them for more information on that. And then as you can see here, um, this graph on the left shows um, Pueblo County. And then on the right is a more um, zoomed in picture of the gray pins on the board are where we have our regulatory grade monitors stood up by the Air Pollution Control Division. And then the green pins are where we anticipate standing up this network around Colorado, um, particularly in Pueblo proper and then also outside of Pueblo proper. Um, we met with Mothers Out Front a couple months ago um, to really work on where they would like to site these monitors. Um, so we're really excited. I think it'll give the community a, a nice opportunity to understand the pollutants in their community um, and really make informed decisions uh, about the pollutants that they are seeing. Just very briefly, a couple of other things that we do. Um, I'm a former high school teacher. I taught for about 250,000 years, and um, 200 of those were during COVID. And one of the things that we have done is we have developed an air uh, quality curriculum. So we're really looking to get that out. We are already partnering with Pueblo District 60 and Pueblo District 70 so that students will start making sense of the data that are collected by Mothers Out Front and their monitoring network and use that to come to conclusions about what should be done in the community. So really making sure that our little Gen Z Zoomers have, a, have a, st a say in this, right? They have a giant stake in this. Additionally, we're partnering with a researcher who's based at the University of Washington, and she is doing a project at Pueblo East High School as part of a youth participatory action research project. Um, if you're interested in learning more, we are so happy to talk about this, but basically she has six air quality monitors inside Pueblo East. Students are, again, making sense of that data, and the kids are trying to decide what they need to do to protect themselves, especially from wildfire smoke events. So we're gonna be back there. Please feel free to stop by. We have all sorts of, of uh, documents and things like that. And in these last 15 seconds, I just wanna make sure I leave you all with this QR code, which will take you to a lot of additional resources. We also have those in the back. Thank you so much. Great, and yeah, so during the open house after these presentations, definitely go talk to Colorado Department of Public Health and the Environment, talk to mothers out front. Um, NREL has also been doing some studies relating carbon management and air quality, uh, so definitely talk to them as well. So all three of those booths are in that corner right over there. Uh, next up, I would like to invite uh, Charles Parco, president of the local United Steelworkers Union, and uh, he is going to give a little bit of context of the history of industry in Pueblo. What's that? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, again, my name is Charles Perko. I am president of United Steelworkers Local 3267. I represent about 160 office and technical workers at the steel mill. Uh, we have a separate local that represents uh, over 900 production and maintenance workers as well. Um, the steel workers in Colorado have been very involved um, in uh, air and climate law over the last several years uh, because it affects our members directly. Uh, what I would like to do tonight is talk a little bit about the history of Pueblo, uh, where we're going, uh, where we've been, and then uh, talk a little bit about labor's goals for um, this sort of work as we move forward. Uh, the, <coughs> sorry. Uh, the, the history of uh, industry in Pueblo is really the history of Pueblo itself. Pueblo would not exist without manufacturing, without mining, without agriculture. The, uh, the city of Pueblo was founded because it was on the confluence of two rivers, it was on an area that was very easy to get materials into uh, to support the mining industry in the 1850s. Now, William Palmer, uh, who was the founder of the NRG Railroad and the Steel Mill, he liked to build railroads in places that had canyons because canyons are a good place to put a railroad grade um, so you can get your materials into the mountains and get your, um, your minerals, metals, raw materials out. And it was very, very expensive at the time to bring rail into Colorado from the nearest steel mill, which at that point was in Chicago. 
because of that, he decided that because we had abundant natural resources in Colorado, because we had um, the water, because we had uh, everything that was needed here, except for at the time really the workforce, um, that he was going to put the first steel mill west of the Mississippi in Pueblo. And so he put that uh, steel mill right where it is right now um, in 1872. Uh, we've been around for 100 150 years. Uh, but because of the railroad infrastructure, the infrastructure that was built at that time, we started to see other industry as well. So with the steel mill, with the railroads came immigrants, workforce, and as the minerals came out of the mountains, we also developed a heavy smelting industry. At one time, Pueblo, Colorado had five smelters operating. Now the last of these shut down uh, just after World War II, or after, sorry, uh, World War I, uh, with the closure of the Philadelphia, or the Colorado smelter uh, down by the river. Unfortunately, with the flooding of the Great Flood of 1921, uh, that particular smelter it was deemed uh, too costly to rebuild and so was replaced with uh, facilities elsewhere in the state of Colorado. Uh, but because of that, it led the way for the land that was occupied by those smelters to be uh, uh, taken in by the steel mill and uh, what was at one time just a rail mill. It created railroad rail, um, then expanded into the other products and became the largest vertically integrated uh, steel mill west of the Mississippi River. Uh, we've produced everything from railroad rail, wire, grinding balls for the mining industry, railroad spikes, seamless uh, oil casing starting in the 1950s, and a number of other products including structural steel. Now uh, with that industry, um, obviously steel is a very carbon hit uh, heavy industry. Um, and so we as an industry have had to adapt over time to uh, many of the changes in air quality laws, water quality laws, and we believe we've done very well with that. Um, sometimes the mill has been forced to do things due to changes in regulation. Other times we've done it because it made economic sense. Uh, in the 1960s, we went from open hearth steel making to uh, basis, basic oxygen steel making, which we operated for a number of years which allowed us to use absolutely no fuel in the production of steel from our pig iron that came out of the blast furnaces. Um, that decreased the cost of running those furnaces and also made for a better product. Uh, in the 1970s, it became economical to re recycle steel more than uh, to bring in raw materials, and so we brought on the arc furnaces. Now, a lot of people have probably heard about the arc furnace. That is the largest electrical uh, piece of electrical equipment in the state of Colorado. Now, a lot of people don't understand what that really means and what it means to decarbonize a piece of equipment like that. So what I want you to imagine is uh, you go to uh, your kitchen in the morning, you want to make breakfast, and so you stick a couple of pieces of toast in your toaster in the morning. Now, that toaster is probably a 900-watt toaster, two slices. Our arc furnace could make over 325,000 pieces of toast um, at once. Uh, so you can imagine the kind of electricity use that uses. Um, to put that in another perspective, uh, that's about uh, 2.3 million 60-watt light bulbs. So if we can take that and use electricity that's not created by carbon, then we're uh, well on our way to completely decarbonizing our steel, uh, steel making process. And uh, because of the closure of the Comanche uh, 1 and 2 uh, several years ago, or the, the effort to do that, uh, we decided um, that we would partner with Xtel Energy um, to not only survive because we need electricity to continue uh, to make steel, uh, but to do it in a way that uh, we think makes us pretty unique in the industry today, and that is to put a solar field in. Um, it's a 300 megawatt solar field, and it supplies roughly a little over uh, twice what we use at any given time to run our arc furnace, which means that although we can't use the solar field obviously at night, um, the energy it puts back into the grid as clean solar power um, then um, balances out what we use at night to continue to operate that facility 24 hours a day. And so um, as steel workers, we're pretty proud of that because right now we are the only uh, steel mill in the country that can uh, really uh, claim that. Uh, as the steel mills decline, Pueblo has also brought on a number of other manufacturing uh, facilities. Uh, we make wind towers, we make railroad ties, we make a variety of other products. Uh, we made the Delta II rod, uh, rocket for a number of years out in the Air Force Industrial Park that allowed us to launch the GPS system. Um, so Pueblo's modern industrial, um, it's pretty well known around the country. But we as labor, when we look at these sorts of uh, projects, we definitely uh, we look at them with concern and we want to make sure that they're done right. And so Pueblo 
Uh, here in Pueblo and as well as everywhere else, labor has a number of goals that we definitely um, are, are looking for as we adopt to the new uh, energy economy as well as uh, move in the right direction on all this because we as steel, steel workers, we live in the communities where our plants operate and so we want to make sure that they're uh, clean because that affects our families as well. And so when we do this, we want to make sure, number one, that we can protect the manufacturing facilities that already exist as much as possible. Now, in a place like our facility, that might bring, mean bringing on new products. Uh, that might mean uh, using a mill that we currently use in a different way. That might bring, mean cleaning up the processes we use. But those sorts of jobs, they're hard to come by. Uh, our contract, which I carry with me almost all the time, this is my union contract, is about 75 years old. And it is very, very difficult to negotiate a new union contract. If anyone's ever been done that, they know how hard that is. And so through the blood, sweat, and tears that it's taken to uh, negotiate that book, we don't want to see it go away because a new facility is not going to have anything like that. And so that's our number one goal is to make sure we do this in a common sense way. <laughs> For those facilities that do have to go away or for those new facilities that are going to be built because there's a lot of opportunities here, we also want to make sure that when we build those facilities that it be done in a union fashion. Um, that could mean a project labor agreement. Um, that could mean labor neutrality for a new employer when they come into Pueblo and use a tax credit. Um, there are a lot of different ways to do that, but we want to make sure that labor has a seat at that table when we bring in those new facilities and those new jobs. Uh, a union construction job brings a lot more pay and benefits to a, a union member than a non-union one, and the quality you get is a lot better, I guarantee it. Um, the other thing that we definitely want to see is uh, that uh, we close a loop, the loopholes that exist in current law that allow cheating. Uh, if anyone's driven up and down Northern Avenue in the last couple of months, you can see what a non-union road construction job looks like. Um, there are multiple holes in Northern Avenue um, that have been put in by multiple companies and nothing really lines up. If you bid that as one single job, subject to Davis-Bacon and all the various laws that apply to a state-funded uh, labor project, that would have been done a lot quicker and we wouldn't be looking at a project six months later that still isn't finished. So uh, when it comes to labor, we do definitely have some things to say about this. We want to have a seat at the table and uh, we're definitely there for the ride. Thank you. Great, thanks so much, Chuck. So uh, next up, here to speak about the U.S. Department of Energy's Carbon Management Program and Community Benefit Plans, uh, we have Tracy Rodosta and Kelly Romer. So come on up. Let me get you. Oh, thank you. I was like, clicker? Give me just a second here. So um, my name is Tracy Rodosta and I'm a geoscientist by training. And geoscientists and geologists, we love to talk about rocks. So I have promised the people here that I'm going to stick to my notes and not talk a lot about rocks and go off on a tangent. So I will try to keep to the time commitment as best as I can. Okay. Great, so again, the DOE's Office of Co Fossil Energy and Carbon Management, or what we call FECM, and you'll hear us use that a lot, conducts research, development, de demonstration, and deployment across many different technology areas. And we do this to help reduce carbon emissions and other environmental impacts based on fossil fuels and other industrial processes. So these five technologies you he see here and the stuff that you heard from Josh earlier today um, highlight some of these key areas that we're focused on. I'm going to be talking about carbon storage which is it's the, um, the second one on the list. So people, people um, ask me all the time, Tracy, how long have, has this been going on? What are we doing? The fact is, is that for over 20 years, in fact, even longer than that, um, the Department of Energy or Fossil Energy and Carbon Management have been spending time learning and doing a methodical approach to scale up carbon storage. So we've developed and, and validated technologies since back in the late 1990s, but most that people are aware of is the Regional Carbon Sequestration Partnerships, which you heard see behind me, and we've demonstrated, used these to demonstrate the readiness of carbon um, 
commercial scale carbon storage for almost 20 years. And we did it very methodical. And I'll say that because I want people to understand we, this is not something that's just happened overnight. In 2003, we started with regional characterization. And we had to look and find where are the sources? Where are the, the places that we need to have the sinks? And where do we need to do storage? From there, we went to these small scale tests. And these small scale tests are really important because they were helping us validate and find those areas that we could do these larger scale projects. And so when we moved to the larger scale projects back in 2008 to 2021, again, this has been a long period of time, these projects were conducting um, tests to verify risk assessment and mitigation processes. We were including in these stakeholder engagement so that we'd understand community needs, and we were validating monitoring technologies and op optimizing the operational parameters. And this is important because understanding how we characterize these sites and understanding how we monitor these sites are very important to the public because you want to know how do we pick these sites. So when we pick a site, there are critical components to all these sites that we look at. So when we first start out, so we think about where is the geologic storage project? What is the subsurface geology that we're looking at? Where are the CO2 sources in the area? What is the transportation needed to get the CO2 from the source to the storage facility? And then what communities are gonna be part of that? And a key consideration in all this is the subsurface characteristics. For example, the types of rocks. And some rocks are suitable for geologic storage and some rocks are not. And so we have a couple of, I think, demonstrations here. We have one over by our FECM, where, where Mary Ellen is, where we can show you where you can hold rocks. You can see what it looks like. And I think we have some core back in the backside as well. It's important for you to pick these up so that you can understand what we're looking at. So the, again, like I mentioned on this slide, the subsurface data collection begins at the basin scale. And this is important because it is, again, very thing is always methodical. You have your basin scale, right? You have potential areas that you've highlighted in these that are near your source that you're looking at. From there, you go and collect data, and then you select areas. And then as you select those areas, you decigrate those areas based upon characteristics within the subsurface, within all those different um, components that I talked about, and you collect these potential sites. And on these sites, what you'll do, do is then you'll find a site that you want to do and go in and you do your characterization. And the characterization is very thorough evaluation. And all the subsurface data that is collected and analyzed will be helpful to be used to be put into these models so that we can ensure and submit the information to the EPA or to the others to make sure that the CO2 will be contained over time. And you'll hear a little bit more about the um, characterization projects as we go after these talks that we have um, from EOS. So this process is great, right? But what does this mean for me and what does this look like? So I wanted to put this up here because these are the four phases of the carbon safe. And of these four phases, as you can see, these pictures represent different activities that are going to be going, going that you might see that happen within these. So for example, if you're in this feasibility stage, right, this is when you're going to have, you might see a well that's being drilled in your, in your area. They might be collecting rock. They might be collecting this, which is the reservoir rock, or these shales, which are the seal rocks. And they're looking at this to understand, again, what is the characteristics that are needed in this area? If you go and you have maybe a site characterization project in your area, what are they collecting there? You might see trucks like this, and these trucks are coming out there to collect, collect seismic data. And this seismic data gives us an image of the subsurface, like you can see here, that what we can do is we can see the, the architecture, and what does the subsurface look like? Because when we look down, all we see is the dirt, right? This helps us image deep down. And when I say deep down, we're talking six, seven, 10,000 feet, deep reservoirs that we're looking at. They might also have other regs that you have in here that are collecting more data so they can understand all the different, again, additional cores always needed, know the extent of the seal, know the extent of the reservoirs. And they put all of this information into geologic models. And what they do is they predict where the CO2 is going to go over time. And as they do that, they develop what they call the area of review. And this is the area of review, and you'll see these types of maps. And what these area of review is used for is that it helps us understand where the CO2 is going to go, where do we need to monitor, because the areas of review are monitored over the life of the project. And so all of this is important as we go through this. And you can see the timescale. This doesn't happen overnight. 
These phases have sometimes two years, sometimes two to three years, and then even four before you get to the construction of a project. And then when you construct a project, then it goes into injection. So all of this is, takes time that we're going at in these different phases of, the, of this. And above all, the main thing you want, I want you to see, and I apologize, it's, I'm going to go do a little skid here. <laughs> Community benefits, because this happens at the very beginning at pre-feasibility all the way through the construction, because this is a really important part of this, and all these projects that we do are required this. And my colleague Kelly Romer is gonna talk more about that as we go um, further on, but I wanna I show you one more slide, because people always say, well, Tracy, where are these projects? Where are they? Where do they belong? Where are they at? So we're here, here's Colorado, and on your map, what you see on the phase two projects that I had mentioned earlier, the earlier stage ones, those are on the light green, and in the phase three projects are in the dark green. And what you can see here is they're across the United States. They're everywhere that we're trying to do because what we're trying to look for are areas that we're trying to find regional solutions because that's something that I think is really important is that every region is unique. Every community is unique. And so what we need to do is we need to find regional solutions across the U.S. where communities are engaged so that we can, again, meet our decarbonization goals. So like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm going to keep it short, so I'm going to hand it off to Kelly. Thank you, Tracy. And I'm losing my voice. So... Quinn, if I'm not talking into the microphone or using it appropriately, just wave at me and remind me to hold it up. Um, first, I want to say, I just want to pause and say thank you so much for being here tonight. Uh, I understand that many folks have traveled or stepped away from their uh, responsibilities or other plans for this evening to be here and learn with us. And I just want to emphasize that the conversations that we have, really, we take those very seriously. Uh, in the Office of Fossil Energy and Carbon Management, and it really does influence and shape the way we implement our programs. And so my name is Kelly Romer. I'm a social scientist on um, FECM's engagement team, and one of, my, um, one of the important parts of my work is to support the implementation of the Community Benefit Plan framework across FECM's carbon management portfolio. So as Tracy mentioned, um, <clears throat> uh, community benefit plans are required across all project types and phases of developments. And when I'm talking about community benefit plans, I'm talking about a set of plans that address societal considerations and impacts. These plans are submitted as part of a project's application package alongside all the technical materials that Tracy was walking through to demonstrate um, that they're ready for that phase. These plans are reviewed by both internal and external experts with expertise in engagement, labor issues, DEIA, and, and um, environmental justice. So um, these, these plans typically um, re represent up to 20% of the application scoring, which means that the quality of these plans plays a big role in final funding decisions. So what is in community benefit plans? Uh, the community benefit plan framework uh, led by DOE-wide is organized around four important priorities. First, early and robust engagement with community and labor stakeholders. Two, to create high quality jobs and invest in workforce development and training. Advance diverse and equitable participation in employment and other economic opportunities associated with project deployment, and to implement the Justice 40 initiative to ensure that project benefits are directed to disadvantaged communities and negative impacts are mitigated. So as Tracy noted, the community benefit plan framework is applied across types of technologies and phases and these community benefit plan activities, similar to those technical aspects of the projects, should be building um, on the work from previous phases. So the types of projects that we 
have been discussing today and will continue to discuss are really focused on feasibility and characterization and will not include construction as part of this project phase. So the community benefit plans for these types of projects really emphasize dedicating time and resources to conduct the necessary research and analysis to better understand the social and economic context of the project area, to conduct the necessary workforce needs and opportunities assessments and engage early with those community and labor partners, to establish two-way engagement mechanisms, and by two-way, we mean what are the processes in place to incorporate public input into project design and implementation. So it's really important that this work happens early in the phases because developing strong agreements, community benefit agreements, project labor agreements that really reflect authentic partnerships and community priorities takes time and it takes trust. And so I wanna just take a moment to talk specifically about the Justice 40 initiative and what that means for community benefit plans. So the Justice 40 initiative is a policy that directs 40% of the overall benefits of certain federal investments to disadvantaged communities. So all of DOE's carbon management projects are covered under Justice 40. And those specific benefits that count towards Justice 40 really emphasize decreasing energy burden and environmental exposure, increasing access to economic opportunities, and increasing environmental and climate resilience. So community benefit plans are a really important way that Justice 40 initiative benefits are to be delivered into um, communities themselves. So what this looks like in practice at the project level is that every application must have a Justice 40 plan that describes all the communities that could experience project impacts, including an environmental and energy justice assessment. So this will characterize communities in the project area that might face existing burdens. This will also include <coughs> description of anticipated project benefits and disbenefits. And it, it's really important that you know we're specific about where and to whom those benefits or disbenefits will accrue and over what time period. For many projects in these phases, they're doing a lot of analysis and um, collecting baseline data to understand what's necessary. And this will inform a strategy that outlines specific steps the applicant will take to address those research gaps, um, articulate and maximize those benefits, minimize the disbenefits, and be able to measure, track, and report on those impacts. So I just wanna emphasize that the explicit attention to environmental justice and the implementation of community benefit plans as a whole across DOE and within FECM represents an important shift in how uh, the agency in our office is, is approaching engagement and working to institutionalize responsible deployment practices throughout uh, the research development and demonstration portfolio. So I'll leave this here for more information. If you have questions about a specific project, uh, the Na National Energy Technology Labs project planning page is a great place to search a specific project. This is where after awarded uh, community benefit plan summaries will be posted. There's also our guidance that we provide to project teams to develop their community benefit plans. And lastly, I recognize that there's a lot of folks with expertise in the room and labor, community engagement, and environmental justice. And this is an opportunity to participate in the merit review process of community benefit plans. Um, you can do this for FECM, but also across DOE's portfolio. Um, it's, time, it's a time commitment. But these are compensated roles, and so we welcome folks to, um, to submit their resumes and participate in that process. So with that, I'll say thank you, and please come see me with your CBP questions at that round table in the back. Thank you.
Thank you. Thanks, Kelly. And yeah, as Kelly mentioned, she'll be in the open house at the back, um, and she'll be here all night. I'll be here all night too. And um, I welcome anybody who wants to come and talk about carbon safe. Like I said, I will talk your ear off. Um, so the, the next thing I want to do is I want to shift a little bit, but I wanted to make one point because Kelly, Kelly put something up there and some people might not make the connection. So there is, a, and there's the National Energy Technology Laboratory. The National Energy, National Energy Technology Laboratory, they are implementing the DOE um, FECM programs. So if, if you want to find out more information, you can always go to the National Energy Technology. They have a, a website like she had up there, and you can look at any of our carbon programs that you want to look at. So it's, it's really important. That's a, another way to look at those. So I am so excited because today we have representatives from some of our DOE projects here to share a brief overview of their proposed project activities and where to find out more information. Now, both of these projects, I want to make sure you understand, um, are selected, not awarded. And why am I saying that? Because this means that a project has been announced, and a lot of those projects that you saw, they have been announced, but they are still going through and proceeding through the negotiation process for award. So this involves discussions on the final scope of work, project milestones, and funding. So I just want to make sure you guys understand that. So once the project is awarded, then if a project is doing field activities, they can go and start doing those and, and doing their engagement. But right now, they're waiting to be finally awarded. So first, we have Beth Mashensky from the University of Illinois to speak about Colorado Regional Direct Air Capture Hub, a feasibility study. And as you mentioned, I saw before, so this project's not going to be going out and doing the drilling and, and activities and stuff that, that, that I was showing you earlier. It is um, looking at a feasibility study for Capture Hub. And then we will have, after that, following her, be Ashley Ross from Carbon America and Dr. Jessica Smith from the Colorado School of Mines. And they're going to speak about the Carbon Safe EOS, which is developed commercial sequestration for the Southern Colorado. And this project will be, when it gets awarded, doing those types of activities. So just want to put that out there for you guys and give the floor. Hey everyone, I'm Beth Machesky with the uh, University of Illinois. My specific department is the Illinois Sustainable Technology Center, which is part of the Prairie Research Institute. Um, I also have MT in the back with me. She's the project manager on our project. Um, I am the community engagement and outreach lead with my um, unit. Our um, project is the Colorado Regional Direct Air Capture Hub. This is direct air capture of carbon dioxide. Um, our partners on the project are GE um, Vernova, Sistera, Carbon America, um, Ecotech Engineering, Nextera Energy, and Visage Energy. Um, this is a feasibility study, so um, we would say paper, but it's really computers. Um, and then the feasibility is looking at all kinds of aspects, so that would be technical, um, business, how will all the um, partners on the project form a business around um, direct air capture? Um, we're also looking at location. Where would be the best location to uh, locate the direct air capture hub? And then, um, most importantly, to me at least, is the um, community engagement. So we want to hear from all of you what you think about direct air capture. Uh, we have some questions at our table in the back. We want to know um, what your concerns are, what um, you think are most important issues in your community, what kind of benefits you'd like to see come out of the project if it were to go into a build phase. And also we want to know what kind of questions you have related to um, the tech or anything else for your director capture. Um, so we're in the back. We'll see you later. Okay, as Tracy mentioned, next up is Ashley Ross and Jessica Smith for um, Project EOS. Hi, um, are we advancing slides? Or somebody? Okay, great. 
Um, so we are here to talk about uh, Carbon Safe EOS. This is um, a Department of Energy uh, a selected project, not yet awarded. And what we're doing here is really looking for that storage solution. I think Tracy and Kelly really set it up really well for us. So this is a Carbon Safe project. So this is a technical collaboration between Carbon America as the commercialization partner and our amazing collaborators at Colorado School of Mines and Los Alamos National Lab. And it's really around the technical collaboration as well as in incorporating all of these socioeconomic components as well. Um, and so what we're really doing here is going to look for, we've done about as much desktop work as we can Tracy talked about the different phases of kind of getting a, a, a project from kind of an idea all the way to operations. That is a really big, long process that takes a lot of time and a lot of data collection. And that's what we're about to embark on here. So what does this look like? Um, so we will be coming out here to drill some test wells to pull up some rock samples. And I encourage you to go see our rock samples in the back there from our well in Northeast Colorado, as an example. So we'll be drilling some test wells to pull up all those rock samples like Tracy talked about and shooting the seismic data to make sure we understand the structure and that architecture of that subsurface to make sure that we understand the viability of long-term safe geologic sequestration and storage in this region. And importantly, and I love that Tracy did this as well because we've got you know all of the environmental work and all of the community work here throughout the entire project right I think we've talked about the te technical partnership and the collaboration here but this is a partnership with the community and we really are, are anchoring this on the community and why are we doing this here it's not just that it had the right makings of a good CCS project. It has good sources to capture from, reasonable transportation, and what looks to be really good geologic sequestration. But more importantly, this is a community. You've got such a strong industrial heritage, as Chuck talked about. And that's why we named this actually Project Eos, as a, which is the Greek goddess of the dawn, meant to enable a new opportunity and a new industrial era for the Pueblo community. So we're really excited that the Community Benefits Plan is central to our overall project approach. Uh, so we are very committed as an entire project to two-way communication. Um, right now we are in a learning phase, trying to understand local priorities, local histories, local desires for your energy future. Uh, we have a team of social scientists, including myself, a postdoc, and students from the Colorado School of Mines who would be very happy to learn and listen and get to know you better so that we can better integrate your feedback into our overall project. We're also very sensitive to the fact that Pueblo has long and ongoing discussions about your energy future, and there are already multiple platforms and groups, and so we're also trying to understand how we fit into your local ecosystem, um, but we do want to find a way of representing your local priorities in the project. Yeah, and this isn't a checkbox exercise for us. We really do take this really, really deep and really true to heart here at Carbon America. And we really do want to set up this project for the long-term operational success to further your community's economic and social development goals. So please reach out. We will have, this is very, very early stages of the project. There's very little that's kind of finalized. So please reach out and engage with us as we kind of co-create what this could look like for um, a new opportunity for Southern Colorado. Thank you. Great. And so now our last panel before we go back to the open house and then you can go to all the booths and ask all of your questions. Um, we got a lot of questions around safety and regulation of uh, CO2 capture, CO2 transport, CO2 storage. So we wanted to try to address some of those with this panel now. So I'd like to welcome up to the stage um, Mark, Mark and Tom and um, Wendy here. Uh, so before we dive into to the panel, and you guys might as well sit in this order that I have you so that people know who's who. I'll sit there. Yeah. All right. Uh, so before we dive into the panel, uh, I want to thank Tom and Wendy and Mark for being here. So advancing carbon management solutions and infrastructure involves multiple federal agencies, state and local uh, regulators. And so that's why this panel discussion here today is so important because it will help provide some context 
into how carbon, man carbon management projects are regulated, uh, both in Pueblo and across the United States. Uh, so with that in mind, I would like to introduce you to Mark Seeley. Uh, he is from Colorado's Energy and Carbon Management Commission. Uh, Wendy Chang, uh, I apologize, how do you pronounce your name? Chung. Wendy Chung. Wendy Chung from the Environmental Protection Agency, Region 8, and Tom Finch from the Department of Transportation, Pipeline and Hazardous Materials Safety Administration. Uh, and so first, I'm going to grab the clicker here, and I'll come down and join you guys. Um, <clears throat> and so at, at first, I want to start off the, the panel discussion with, oh, I'm going to switch mics. Nope, OK. Um, I want to start off the panel discussion with uh, just a brief answer from each of you as to um, what your agency's role is in carbon management in Colorado. So um, why don't you go ahead and start us off there, Tom? Uh, is this working? It's hard, hard to teach an old guy new tricks. Oh, at any rate, our role is uh, the safety of transport of uh, hazardous materials. We have a hazmat side, and we're the pipeline side. So, you know, safety is our role, and we want to transport anything in a pipeline safely. So I'm with the EPA Underground Injection Control, or UIC, program. And through the Safe Drinking Water Act, we protect underground sources of drinking water. And so there are six well classes in the UIC program. And for purposes of tonight, um, we'll be talking about class six, which is specifically for carbon sequestration. And, um, <clears throat> and so what that means is we take CO2 that's coming from the pipeline from over here and then putting into the subsurface. Um, so that CO2 normally W could would be emitted into the sub into the air, so it's a way to mitigate climate change. And the other piece that we'll hear about more from Mark is that we review and approve primacy applications. And primacy essentially means that um, the state has has demonstrated that they have the authority to um, regulate the Class Six program in lieu of EPA. Hello, my name is Mark Seeley, and as um, Wendy mentioned, the EPA currently has jurisdiction over Class 6 CO2 injection wells. The state of Colorado is in the process of uh, getting its uh, regulatory regime and uh, legal authority um, and laws established so that we can assume primacy, uh, which is regulatory authority over Class 6 wells. Uh, towards the end of this year, we will we'll be applying for that. Um, what our current jurisdiction is, is as um, Ashley Ross from Carbon America mentioned, drilling a science well. Uh, we currently have authority over permitting science wells. Great. Thanks so much. Uh, so, Mark, I'm going to go back to you and ask, uh, what is Colorado's history of carbon management? And um, can you give us a little bit of a timeline and the steps towards your application for primacy? And here's the clicker. For sure. And I will also go back to what uh, Dominic said as the Greenhouse Gas Pollution Reduction Roadmap 2.0. Uh, it started out as 1.0 back uh, at the beginning of this decade. And in that, um, CCUS was identified as a tool within the toolkit that could be utilized and leveraged to help with the state's decarbonization efforts. And so coming out of that, uh, my colleague Mike Rigby, who's at our ECMC table over there, um, there's three reports that have been uh, generated over the last couple of years. Uh, the first one, uh, which he kind of was the sole lifter of, essentially identified what are the requirements, what are the prerequisites for the state of Colorado to obtain primacy from the EPA, or to say it another way, what technical considerations need to be put in place so that when the state of Colorado applies for primacy, we will actually be granted authority to regulate it. Last year, at the beginning of last year, was the second of three reports that dove a little bit deeper into uh, the legal gaps uh, in our state laws that needed to be uh, adjusted. Specifically, and happy to talk about this offline uh, with folks after the fact, poor space ownership. So underneath uh, 
underneath the surface, the tiny voids of space in the ground where the carbon dioxide will be stored, who owns that? Um, currently, it is not defined in this state, so there's a current bill uh, that is actually going through uh, legislation right now that will define that. The other one uh, gap in, in the state law was around aggregating property rights uh, or unitization. And so that, uh, that second report really dove into you know, those legal gaps as well as permitting considerations. What are the environmental justice uh, considerations that should be taken into account when the state of Colorado uh, assumes primacy? Last year was also a big year on the legislative front, uh, SB 23-285, and I should have had it up here, I apologize, I don't, kind of changed the commission's order, if you will. So, um, I'm relatively new in the last six months to the ECMC, and when I tell people I work at the ECMC, they're like, I have no idea what ECMC is. What are you talking about? Essentially, the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission, the COGCC, was, had a, its scope expanded last year based upon SB 23285 to include a wider array of energy and carbon management initiatives. And so the rebranding of the name from COGCC to ECMC occurred last year. Also, SB 23016 was a very important piece of legislative work last year that set kind of the future framework for classic, uh, classics re or regulation uh, in the state. And it really focused around siting measures. So classics wells, once Colorado receives primacy, will not be allowed within 2,000 feet of a residence, a school, or a commercial building. We are also mandated to perform a robust cumulative impact analysis on each proposed well. And then if that cumulative impact analysis comes back to be negative and that community was designated as a disadvantaged community, then the ECMC must deny that permit application. Now, this is only applicable when we have primacy. So that is why we are trying to get everything uh, square on the legal side as well as the regulatory side so that we can have authority uh, in the future. The final kind of third report that just came out at the beginning of this year really dove into the safety uh, considerations really from soup to nuts in regards to CCS activities from overviewing and um, reviewing capture technology through pipeline regulations and safety considerations to the individual well and injection and well integrity management practices as well as the subsurface uh, reservoir storage, uh, monitoring, measuring, um, long-term kind of site care, if you will. So I'm um, happy to talk more about uh, those reports. We have a copy of each of those three at our table. Also a, a shameless plug. We brought a bunch of handouts, kind of one pagers on CCUS, but most importantly is down at the bottom right, there's a QR code that will link you to our library resource page that has links to all of the different reports as well as kind of summary pages uh, just to help build up everybody's uh, educational base. So. Great, thanks so much, Mark. So their booth is right over there, so go check them out uh, once we're done with this panel. So Wendy, so Mark said they are applying for primacy. What does that take? Like, there's so much that goes into being able to get a class six well permitted, right? In order to assure safety and CO2 stays in the ground and all kinds of measures. So I'm going to pass it over to you to explain. So just to clarify, you're, you're asking about primacy, not necessarily the permitting process, correct? Um, I, I guess I'm asking about the, the permitting process specifically. Both. The, I get, okay. What does Colorado have to prove in order to overtake that role? To, to, take, to get primacy. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so... Um, when we get an application from the state, what we are looking for is that their rules are as stringent as EPA. So literally what that means is line by line, we are comparing their regulations against the federal regulations. They can be more stringent, but they have to be, they can be more stringent, but they have to be as stringent. And I've done that work. It's not the most exciting part of my job. Um, the other piece that we would like to see is that the the Attorney General has has um, has expressed that that the program is enforceable and that the agency ECMC has the authority to run the Class Six program. So those are the key components. Great. And um, 
do you want to explain a little bit more about then uh, the the permitting process? Yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> so this slide I really like because it basically graphically shows you all the different pathways where CO2 can go to the surface. And um, if we can contain the CO2 where it belongs, down in the injection formation, then we have protected underground sources of drinking water, which are typically shallower. And we'll just leave it at that. There's, it's a little bit more complicated than that. But um, as you can see, uh, well, actually, what, we t what uh, Ashley as well as Tracy spoke to is the location of the siting of the well. It's extremely critical. What the operator wants is to be able to find a zone where there's a significant um, porosity, thickness, to, allow, to store all the CO2 that they expect to be injected. The other piece that is extremely critical is the confining layers. CO2 is, is buoyant, meaning it wants to float up. And so that upper, upper layer is extremely critical. It will prevent the fluid from moving in two shallow formations. Another, and, and then um, the other piece of the site characterization is to ensure that there are no fractures or faults. As you can see, if there's one that intersects the injection zone, it could, the CO2 can make its way into shallow formations. Also for faults, um, when, so faults can serve as a conduit, but, but um, oftentimes it also, is a ceiling fault, and, but it becomes an issue when you are injecting CO2, increasing the pressure and the fault slips, and then therefore it creates, um, it creates a, a, a space in which the CO2 then will, will go into the surface, but also cause, um, cause earthquakes, or what's called induced seismicity. Then, um, then we look at other penetrations. One is artificial penetrations, such as abandoned or actually active oil and gas wells. The injection well itself, as you can see, can be a, can be a conduit for fluids to move up, up the side if it is not constructed properly. Um, and, and so, we recognize all the different areas where there's potential concern, and those are the areas that we focus on when we permit, uh, a, permit a well. We have a lot of monitoring going on here. You can see um, four and five. One, what is required is four is a, inject, uh, a monitoring well that is sited above the confining zone. We then have another injection well, I'm sorry, a monitoring well, number five, that is into the injection zone itself, so we can sort of in, we can sort of track where that plume is going. We have shallow monitoring wells as well in 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 the shallow resources. Number ten is the air and and um, soil monitoring wells. Um, then the other piece of the, all of this, which was spoken to a little bit, is that we are tracking this plume and making sure that we know where it's going and it's not going outside of what was described as the area review. In, in, in another piece of the permit is what's called an emergency response plan. So we think about all the different ways in which um, hazards could happen. So for example, if we detect a leak or if an if there's um, a, a disruption in the injection well itself, the operator needs to come up with a plan to make sure that that is mitigated. And, and now I guess that's described in number 16. So there's a lot of monitoring going on while the well is, in, while the well is active. After it's ceased injection, there's another period called the post-injection site care period which at a minimum is 50 years. However, the um, operator can demonstrate that they are, no longer, they are no longer endangering USDWs and they can bring that period down a little bit as well. 
During the post-injection site care period, what we're looking for is reduction in pressure, because once that occurs, it's likely that fluid movement is not going to continue. Um, I think that's it for that, for that slide in terms, of, in terms of what we do with our permit. This last slide is about environmental justice. And as we heard from Kelly Romer with the, um, the, her initiative, EJ is a high priority for the Biden-Harris administration. And it's equally so at, at the EPA. And in this, last, this past fall, we, um, we developed a, a guidance for permitting and, and primacy of class six wells. It, out, it outlines the EJ considerations and expectations for UIC owners and operators. In fact, when we want to integrate EJ principles and equity concerns into, into our permit. Um, it communicated to the states and tribes and that have primacy of, of this guidance and encouraging them to work with us collaboratively to ensure that EJ considerations are met. It also expanded upon tools presented in the Class 6 EJ Quick Reference Guidance. Um, one last piece that I'll mention is that through the bill, the, the Bilateral Infrastructure Law, $48 million have been made available to the states to get primacy. And because EJ is such an important piece of, of the permitting or this Class 6 program, um, as a condition of accepting that grant funding, they need to, the the program that is the application that's coming into us must describe how they are incorporating EJ principles into their program. Thanks. Can I just clarify, Wendy? Yes. So, um, in order to get a permit for a Class Six well, a project developer has to prove or find all of the potential abandoned wells and potential fractures and water, groundwater, and, and prove that essentially where the plume is going to go when injected and that it's not going to be able to escape. Is that right? So, let me put it this way. So one, we need to demonstrate that, that the CO2 is essentially staying in the injection formation. And for us to I guess acknowledge that or understand what's going on, we do monitor how far the plume is going away from the injection well so that it stays within the area of view, which is the area in which uh, we, are, we expect the plume to go and also, also the considering pressure fronts that would potentially push CO2 into, the subs in, in sh into shallow surface. Okay. Yeah. So the so the project developer then has to put monitoring wells around to keep track of that kind of thing. Is that right? So I, I showed what the requirements are. One is you need to you need to have one above the injection zone, and then you need to have one in zone. How many depends on the specifications of that particular permit. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I just want to go to Mark really quickly before we head over to Tom. So um, after hearing about all of these requirements for these class six well permits and, and ECMC, the, the Colorado Energy and Carbon Management Commission is trying to be able to get primacy in order to grant class six well permits. Uh, how, how do we, how are you doing that? Can, can ECMC achieve all of these things? What are you doing to, to be able to do that? Sure, that's a good question, and thank you. I wanted to actually interject and say we set, I feel like we set Wendy up a little bit trying to explain in five minutes the class six regulations and overview because they are so extensive and so robust. They are the most stringent well class that exists. Uh, and our third report over there is about 113 pages of light reading for all those that want to dig into the nuances and even beyond what, what Wendy talked about. So um, the ECMC is the right agency in Colorado to regulate it. We have the educational background and staff of uh, geologists and, and geophysicists that has the expertise uh, to evaluate uh, injection wells in the subsurface. And so uh, we are definitely the right place to have that. Um, and as I mentioned, where we currently sit is the bill is uh, 
is currently going through the session in order to get kind of pore space and unitization up to speed. We will then be working on class six regulations this summer, then a applying for primacy uh, towards the end of this uh, end of this year. And then also last Friday, we just finished actually submitting a grant uh, to the EPA for funds essentially to boost our program, both in personnel and resources that, so that we're, we're fully capable of handling it uh, when we are accepted for primacy. Great, thank you. All right, Tom, I wanna turn to you and, and Wendy, if you could pass the clicker. We've got some slides from Tom as well. Um, so tell me, so FEMSA, or Pipeline and Hazardous Materials Safety Administration, regulates CO2 pipelines. Um, how is CO2 transported in pipelines today? It, are, are there existing pipelines? How long have we been doing this? Okay. Let's start there. Uh, mainly in the supercritical state. Are you talking in the... Okay, can you hear me better now? Yes, thank you. <laughs> okay, mainly in the supercritical state uh, since 1980, and I'm that old, I remember the pipeline being built from the Four Corners area down to uh, the Permian Basin, and that one, supercritical and a pretty long pipeline. So uh, we only have about 5,000 miles of pipeline that are in the supercritical state, only have about 500 miles that are gaseous right now. So you can see that that's not a very large portion when we regulate three and a half million miles of pipeline total, counting natural gas and hazardous liquid. Of course, about half of that is, uh, you know, the states uh, doing the, the uh, distribution pipelines. So I don't know if I answered your question. Yeah, well, are there any risks? What are the risks to CO2 in supercritical state, um, transporting it via pipeline, what are the potential risks? Well, that's a good point. Thank you. Well, in the liquid phase, it's it's pressured enough, cooled enough that it's in the uh, liquid phase. It's transported at a higher pressure, actually. So uh, that's the supercritical. Sorry about that. I'm glad you asked that question. So back to the other one. Yeah. And hold the mic right up okay, here. Okay, what were you? <laughs> what are the risks for transporting supercritical CO2 via pipeline? Well, of course, you know, CO2 is not a great gas to escape. I mean, I'll be honest with you. Uh, so far, we've kept, I think we've only had one incident in the last 25 years. And uh, fortunately, we had good emergency response. But you guys know what it's like if you don't get enough oxygen. I'll just be honest with you. So we try to bear down more on the uh, on the uh, carbon dioxide pipelines and inspect them more often. And, uh, you know, knock on wood, that one I mentioned from the Four Corners down to the Permian Basin for tertiary production at the time, actually injecting, uh, no problem so far. Of course, I opened my mouth too. So. But that is the main risk, you know, the. We had uh, Sertarsha, some of you are aware of that, in Mississippi. Uh, you want to make sure the emergency responders are well-trained, the public is well aware of what's going on. Uh, I've talked to the BLM, actually, out in uh, the Colorado, Utah area, uh, when there was carbon dioxide pipelines that we wanted to have them be able to patrol, and they didn't realize that you had to keep the vegetation down so you can see what's going on because this will huddle near the ground and puddle and all that. So, you know, if you see a odd looking puddle or something like that, it looks a little bit like frost, uh, you know, try and stay away, call it in, you know, uh, that's the best thing to do. And you can always call 911 if you're real worried about it or the pipeline operator that you should be aware that they're there. So uh, so how often do you guys inspect the pipelines? Uh, usually on the carbon dioxide once a year, but uh, most pipelines one to three year intervals at the most. And uh, we have risk factors that we use in inspecting pipelines. If they have done anything wrong, they're you know, rise to the top of the spectrum. So, um, you know, we have about 
300 and some pipeline operators and units in the western region, that's the 12 western states, and those get prioritized. And fortunately, when I started, I got them getting ancient now, year 2000 with this, um, we only had about eight or nine inspectors. Now we've got 35. So, you know, they, we're getting to where we can concentrate more and uh, recycle our inspections more. We also have state programs that can do our inspections for us, like California State Fire Marshal Hazardous Liquids is what they inspect. So I've been with them on actually hydrogen pipelines that were inspected. I hope that answers your question. Yeah. Did you want to show some slides? Well, yeah, go ahead. I don't know what you put up there. Uh. It's like, <laughs> so this will be potluck. This is from your... Uh, yeah, okay. Here's your CO2 pipeline network, and you can see with the pipeline I mentioned going from southeast corner of Utah down to the Permian Basin. You can see the heaviness of the pipelines. They're, I apologize, it's kind of a dark green, but you got a light green background, so hopefully you can see we've got more in Wyoming, and actually um, there's your pipeline miles from 2010. We had 4,600 to 2022, we're up to 5,400. So there hadn't been a whole lot, uh, you know, only about 800 miles of pipeline built since 2010. And a total of 5,385 miles. Uh, and of course, that's a part of the 3.3 million miles that we regulate. So we'll go to the next one, unless you guys have any questions on that. With that 5,300 miles of CO2 pipelines, uh, many more are being developed, but um, you know everybody's going to argue, but they're the most efficient method of transportation of large quantities of CO2. Uh, our pipeline incident 20-year trends, we're, we're trying, we're being more of a data uh, organization. And since 2004, average uh, reportable accidents per 1,000-mile rate for regulated CO2 pipelines is actually lower in the part 195s where that falls hazardous liquids than what we have for hazardous liquids. You can just, I won't go through every year, but I don't know if you can get a red note. At any rate, 2004, the blue is your hazardous liquid average and the orange is your CO2 average. So the average is 1.93 um, incidents per thousand miles and uh, for hazardous liquid and CO2 is only 1.09. Uh, might be because we know it's a little more uh, contentious and we inspect it a little more often. Let's see if we got any more slides. Yep. Um, in the last five years, that'll bring it down 2018 to the uh, end of July 2023. There's a reportable accidents for 1,000 mile rate. Uh, 0.92 compared to hazardous liquid total, which is 1.56. So uh, and we're making the gap uh, even wider with the rates being 0.56 for CO2 and uh, 1.29 for hazardous liquid pipelines. But what I like to see is the blue and the orange going down every year. You know, we should have a curve going down. And it's, it, it's going down, but we want it to go down faster. And that's about it. Let's see. Great. Yeah, I did want to mention uh, one thing. Breaking on Emma, it is National Safe Digging Month, so uh, you know, please don't forget to call eight one one. And everybody's been so serious. I got to tell one thing on my daughter, if you'll let me. There's, we were sitting in Sedalia, you know where that is, at Bud's eating a hamburger, and my daughter goes, "So, Dad, we were talking about a guy who got an award." She goes, so dad, if you're going to bury a body, you should call 811 before you dig. And, and we. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So at any rate, and we looked at her and said, you know, I, like, are, is she serious? And she was serious. So, yeah, she, she was, went to college and she also got to be friends with Joker's wife, was asked to go to basketball games. You know what she said? I don't like basketball. So 
you know, I told her, get the tickets for us next time. But at any rate, I'm sorry. I wanted to get a little lighthearted. Yeah. Great. Well, um, so I want to, I just want to get a poll because we, we had planned a 15 minutes of, of scheduled question and answer, but I also think we can get way more questions answered if we break into our open house now and you guys can go to the booths and talk to the specific people to which you have questions. So I want to just take a quick poll and see, uh, should we go to the open house now or should we go to the, the structured 15 minutes of Q&A? Um, raise your hand for the open house. Okay, all right, raise your hand for the Q&A. All right, I feel like it's looking open house is winning the, the, and so since we have limited time, I wanna go ahead and transition to the open house um, in order to get the most questions answered. Uh, before we do that, I just wanna say I put, I put all of the booths here. If you're looking for a booth, um, the, their signs are up on them as well. Um, and also we have post-event surveys. We'll be standing at the door holding them. We want you to fill them out before you leave, please, because uh, we want to know if you learned something tonight or what your thoughts are, um, if this was helpful. So we really, really appreciate you guys coming. Please go around to all the booths. And just a reminder, um, the Spanish interpreters are here. If you need Spanish interpretation, si quieres traducción en español, hablan con ellos aquí. Gracias. Oh. Also, if you guys did write down questions, please feel free to bring them over here. We'll post them on the questions board. We will collect them and review them. Those are really important and helpful for us. And um, thank you.